Can you hear me? If you're in the chat and can hear me, please type hear me. No sound. I can't read lips. <laughs> there you go. Can you hear can you hear both of us? Technical difficulties. Both of us. Oh. Yes. You good to go? Okay. I don't know why that didn't. It must have. I hooked up a mic and then. I don't know. Sorry, guys. So, anyway. Right. Uh, the USB C came out with some pretty cool news. A while ago, they came out with a new rule starting 2020 that you're not going to be able to use weight holes. And I've actually had a couple of people ask me what this is all about. So, right now, the rule states that when you drill a bowling ball, you can have up to one ounce of side weight in comparison to the, to the other side. And so, um, when you go over that ounce, you have to have a weight hole um, to take some weight out of it in order to get it back under an ounce. And uh, so, they change it to where it's no longer a limit to one ounce. You have three ounces of, of side weight. So, now um, you don't need to use weight holes and you're not allowed to use weight holes. So they're, they, they eliminated weight holes completely but allowed you more side weight. So you could – and the general rule of thumb is if you look at the, the CG of your bowling ball um, and you go an inch to the right, that's about an ounce. So when you kick your CG out really far, that gives it too much side weight and then you need a weight hole. So they made it to where you can have three ounces. You can kick it out as far as you want pretty much. and then, But they were starting that in 2020, August of 2020, and it was just going to be a hard cut. Bam. Uh, you're no longer allowed to use weight holes, and they just came out with a, a, an article giving us a grace period that August of this year, you can have what you can start uh, using the three ounces of side weight on your way to drill bowling balls, and you can still use weight holes as your normal way, um, and then starting 2020 of August, then you can, um, then you are no longer allowed to use weight holes. So I think it's good. I think it's good they're giving us a grace period. What do you think? Yeah, I think. The grace period is definitely necessary. Uh, real quick, how's my audio, guys? You guys, I heard someone say Kyle's echoey. I'm trying to do this outside. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to be outside. But if you guys could comment, let me know how my audio is. If not, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep talking. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the grace period you gotta have it. You know, um, someone said not great. Okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Setting. Guys, Maybe I should go inside. No, 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 you're good. Is it, is it like my audio is turned down on the program or something? It probably is a lot of noise. So I think... All right, talk. Talk. <laughs> what? How's the audio? Any better? I, I don't know. You're just a quiet guy, Kyle. Go inside. Uh, is Kyle's audio better? Real quick. Is it better? I don't know. Brad said he tried to change something. It's all good, Kyle. It's all good. Good? Good. good. Almost too loud. What the <laughs> All right, I'm just we're just gonna call it this. Um, all right, it looks like the consensus is better. There's birds on your perch. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm in my backyard. It's like there's like this woods behind me, so there's definitely a chance that there's just like all these birds going. And I'm I got my dog inside because I couldn't leave her outside for the whole podcast because if she's around, there's a good chance she starts barking. And I didn't want to have to deal with that. <laughs> but either way, um, okay. Uh, so we got the, 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 the grace period where we're talking about, I def it's necessary. You got to have it. You know, I think, uh, a lot of us are first like thing we were thinking about when like this rule came out, which I, I, I agree with the rule. I think the weight hold change is fine. Uh, but you know, when, when they came out with this rule, a lot of guys were thinking, well, I don't know what my ball is going to do with three ounces of side weight in it. I don't know, like, you know, anywhere more than an ounce. I don't know what my ball is going to do. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be this day that I have to have that. So 
Um, you have to have a grace period in there to try some layouts, try some different things, just to see how your balls are going to react. And you know, I'm not, in, I'm definitely not criticizing USBC on this. Uh, I think they do a great job first and foremost. You know, their, their job is a lot harder, and I think people give them credit for. Um, do they mess up on some things? Yeah, and, and this is one of the things where I think they got to do a better job. You know, uh, you know, again, I, I love what they do, but you know, if you're in that room making this decision. And someone's got to say, like, the, the topic has to come up to where a grace period needs to be set into effect. Like, you know, no offense to anyone who's making these decisions, but you got to be like, you know, we can't expect everybody to just throw three ounces of side weight in a day and not know what it does. So I, I, this is where I think criticism comes in when USBC makes some decisions is they got to get a broader spectrum of like, you know, cover all their bases when they make one of these rules you know we they got to stop making these little mistakes uh when these rules come out uh because that's where the criticism comes in i think if there was a grace period set in right when this rule was going to be impo- uh uh when it was announced i think it would have went over a little bit uh more smoothly and it's bad it's not bad i uh, you know i think you know they they made they made it right uh they justified it you know we get this grace period it's good i think it's gonna that's gonna help out a lot of people uh, but, you know, overall, good rule change. Just wish they would have done this when they announced the rule. Yeah, they did a little more research. I don't know. I know Dennis Hacker's in the chat, and he, he's a part of the USBC, and I think he's on the national staff now. Uh, congratulations on that. But I don't exactly know how they come up with, you know, all their rules. I know it's not just one guy. You know, a lot of people say think, like, it's just Chad Murphy. Oh, he's a tyrant. Yeah, let's... Yeah, he does what he wants, and no, that's not it, man. There's a lot of people that go into it, so I don't know exactly how. Yeah, come up Dennis actually that. commented here. There was a grace period in the original ruling from January 1st to August 1st, which that is a pretty good grace period. But I know for your and so I'm glad they actually expanded it because you know for your normal bowler like us, we drill a lot of bowling balls, so we'll be able to do a lot of experimenting in that. But for your normal bowlers, they need that two-year grace period. They're only drilling maybe one ball a week, or I mean, sorry, one ball a year or two balls a year. So they probably don't have the resources or want to spend the money to have to, you know, have this seven-month gap of, you know, testing stuff out. So, so, there, was, way, so there was a grace period. Yeah, so it's wow. good that they expanded it. I think, you know, having the two years, giving people an idea of what they can do, what they can expect from their equipment is good. So yeah, cuz it yeah. changed it changes a lot being able to not have weight holes cuz I, I use weight holes all the time. I yeah, mean, I'm al- I'm actually trying to get away from weight holes a little bit uh because I used to put weight holes in all my stuff too and I- I'm testing some more layouts now which it's it's fairly limited when you can only have an ounce of side weight and not put a weight hole in it. Um right. you're really limited in your layouts, but I've been trying to yeah you know, do a few more layouts without weight holes on balls that I would maybe normally put weight holes in just to see what it is, just to try to prepare a little bit in, in my own little way. But yeah, I think either way, good job USBC for putting the longer grace period in. It's definitely the the right thing to do. Yeah, definitely. I think the rule in itself is, is pretty interesting as well. I think it's, you know, USBC, they do these things. They like eliminating weight holes, I think is a big decision to make. Yeah. Like that's a big decision. If you're not familiar with the, with the PBA tour and how they like drill their balls, everybody on tour drills their balls with weight holes. It's yeah. not even like a question. It's like you just you you automatically assume there's a weight hole going in it, and so it changes a lot of stuff about ball motion. So if you think that the best bowlers in the world, all of them are using weight holes to develop a certain ball motion slash reaction, then obviously weight holes are an important part are obviously they allow you to get good ball motion if the best in the world are doing it, and then you eliminate it that's a pretty that's a pretty big change yeah so we got some questions in the chat here let's start since we did say this was a q a let's probably start answering some of those yeah. um i got uh kyle what's your favorite tournament to bowl at and uh man that's that's a tough one uh, there's a lot of really good tournaments throughout the year that we bowl in because, you know, the tournaments, you know, since there's so many different formats, so many different um, environments you're bowling in, uh, the league that I was able to participate in is, pro- I mean, that was, you know, a, 
a spectacle in itself. I, I love that tournament. That's really cool. But it, as far as actual tournaments, um, the Lucy is really good. I like the Lucy. That's a fun little doubles tournament. There's so many because you get the bowl with all the, the best women, the best guys, and they're teamed up, and it's just a fun weekend. So the Lucy, that's in Houston. It's actually coming up end of July for those of you who don't know what that tournament is. Uh, the Lucy's fun. And then I would have to say uh, the majors. I don't know. The U.S. Open, the Masters, those are always fun just because there's so much on the line. Uh, everyone's kind of stepped up their game for those tournaments compared to maybe your normal tour events. Uh, you know, everyone wants it a little bit more because they're majors. So I would say, yeah, those, uh, the Lucy, the majors, uh, those are those are my favorite tournaments to bowl. The majors and the Lucy, huh? I think so. Yeah, the February swing is definitely awesome. Yeah. It's yeah, the February just, swing was awesome. It's just like a it's like a big grind. A lot of it travel, is. a lot of games. It's high pressured. I wasn't able to be in that scenario this year. You were in that scenario this year where you were like close to the leaders at in uh Columbus, right? Or you you finished 15, so you were like in there. You could see the action like you were there. Yeah, and, and two of them. I've I made I've finished top twenty four in two of them. So Yeah. Columbus and the whatever the whatever one wasn't in Indy. So the other two in Ohio. But yeah, those are fun. But that's what that's why I'm so excited for the tour this next uh, upcoming year because just imagine that three week stretch but stretched over the four or five months. Right. It's such a cool feeling, you know, knowing that you can bowl bad one week. And then it's okay because you got another tournament to turn around next week and bowl. So, yeah, the, the Lucy, the Lucy's cool. It's it's cool bowling next to the girls, or with the girls, I guess. Yeah, it is, and it's. I think it's it's interesting for them too because they have to go through a different transition bowling with the guys. You know, uh, no offense to a lot of the girls out there, but you know the transition is different. So some of these girls, when they're bowling with the guys, can transition a little bit better with the whole breakdown of lanes. And then uh, maybe some of the girls struggle with that. They struggle seeing it. So it's it's cool to see uh, the dynamics of the teams. There's always some teams there that surprise you. There's always some really good teams uh, that, that maybe struggle a little bit. And then you got the Calcutta there, which is, like, massive, and that's always fun to get in with. And the Pro-Ams there are huge, and everyone's just there to have a really good time. So that's why that Lucy tournament is, is so fun. Yeah. Also, so I'm trying to I'm messing around with the audio right now a little bit. That's why I'm kind of like not I'm kind of sidetracked on it. So let me, in the in the comments in the chat, let me make sure the audio and and video are are close together and if the audio is good. So if you can. But yeah, dude, the Lucy the Lucy is an amazing because not only does the I don't know you rely like. For example, I bowl with Natalie Cortez, and we don't bowl. We only bowl together once a year. We're really good friends, but we only bowl together once a year. So last year we finished third, and we were leading for a good portion of the tournament. And it was an awesome experience because, for one, I don't have a lot of experience leading a national event, and she doesn't have a lot of experience leading a national yeah. event. <laughs> and uh, and it was just a really like we shared that together. That was a, that was a cool moment for us. So and yeah, then J- and so who won? Jason Sterner and. Uh, Oh, who's who do you win? Poplar, Poplar, Bridget. yeah. Poplar. So yeah. they they shared that moment together as well. So I think it opens up a lot of like really good um, moments for people because you know DeAndre Beatty and Jason Balmani obviously are the favorites, or I think Bill and Ellen Shannon O'Keefe. Which, by the way, Shannon O'Keefe is sick, dude. <laughs> How does she do it? I don't know. Every week, you know, I'm looking at the standings and she is in the hunt. Like she's in the top five, it seems like. Like every single every week. I wonder I, I wonder how many shows she's made. How how many events have they had? Like eight? Maybe. Yeah. I don't I don't know because like normally once the shows and stuff start happening, with shows on Saturday. Yeah. Or whatever. I'm usually bowling on Saturday, so I miss the shows. Like I watch qualifying all Friday and then yeah. lose track when I get to the shows. But it, when I'm looking, I'm like all right, there's Shannon. She's in fourth. All right, there's Shannon. She's in fifth. All right, she's in second. Oh, she's leading. It's like crazy. I know. But by the way, shout out to Jordan Richards this last week on winning. I got or was in Louisville. Was it Louisville? Louisville, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't last week. A couple weekends ago. I saw the cool uh, 
She throws it really good. She was. Uh, so she won. Is she a collegiate player? She was, and then she just. I think she graduated, and now she's go- trying the tour. Uh, I think it was like her fourth event or something I see on Facebook. Uh, just kind of going off the top of my head here. But uh, I've seen Jordan Bull. Uh, I remember, I, th- I think, uh, probably like team trials and some tournaments. And su- like, if you guys haven't seen Jordan Richards throw the ball, uh, it's it's pretty cool to watch. She, she throws it really good. And it was just a matter of time before, you know, she won. It's it, when you, it's, That's one of those players you see out there and you're like, yeah, she's she's got it. There's a... It's kind of funny that her name's Jordan Richard because there's a Jordan Richard in St. Louis. Dude, I know. It was so she used to bowl. She used, when she used to bowl junior gold. Uh, you know, always see her name because she was really good, and would always see her name on like the top of the standings. <laughs> we like, always give, wait. He's bowling in the girls' division. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always give Jordan crap. It's like, man, like <laughs> bowling on the girls' side, you're doing you're doing pretty good. So. Jordan, so Jordan's laying out the pattern that Danny Spink put out this past weekend for his tournament yeah. this weekend. So for those of you who don't know, Jordan Richards, the guy we're talking about, he runs some youth events in St. Louis now, and um, he's trying to get them started. And he's doing a really good job at it, getting a lot of added money. Uh, it's called Impact Bowling. So, And if you guys have any questions on that, just throw it in the chat. We can talk to you guys about it. But either way, short brief, uh, he's running uh, uh, these youth sports chat tournaments in St. Louis, a lot of added scholarship. And, yeah, he's the one coming up is going to be the same pattern that we uh, – did the midnight bowlers tour on good luck to them good luck <laughs> he asked me he asked me if he should <clears throat> we did like a little instagram live thing i think it was yesterday or no Monday. yeah that didn't really work out well his internet connection wasn't good but he was asking me like well should i do this should i not lay it out i i mean what what harm does it do to lay out a pattern that hard for youth bowlers what's the downside yeah, you know, my my thought process is, you know, I'm, I'm for hard bowling, sport bowling, you know, challenging your mind, challenging everything. You know, I, I don't want to cater to anything too easy because I think it, it kind of dilutes the sport a little bit. So in my mind, I think it's OK. Like if, if the winner of that tournament averages 180 and they had to pick spares and, you know, really try different parts of the lane and, you know, you struggle the entire time. Well, that's OK. Like. You know, I think any other thought process, thought process besides that caters to the fact that, oh, we got to make them a little easier so they come back. And I just hate that culture. I hate that idea. I don't I think you just got to bowl on what's out there. And, you know, if it only, if like I said, if it takes 180 average to win the tournament, then it takes you still won the tournament, you know. So, so what what is what why do you think it's so enjoyable to or sorry, not enjoyable to bowl on something hard. So if you're if you're shooting 170 mm-hmm. every game or 180 every game or 190 every game, what's so unenjoyable about that? Is it because you're used to shooting 230s and 240s and you've become accustomed to that and you be you've become accustomed to throwing five and six baggers? Is it just is it is it because you're used to them being easy? Or is it just not enjoyable to shoot 170? Because I think that if the pa- if the pattern's really hard and the scoring pace is hard, and you're shooting 170 and the leader shooting 190, that's just like that's the same thing yeah. as shooting 230 and 240. All relative, yeah. You're just not striking as much. You have to use other elements of the game. You have to like have a strong like a stronger mentality. You have to have more patience. Uh, you have to have better shot making. You have to do like you have to focus on other things. It's still it's still the same game. It's still a yeah. beautiful game. And I and I think I think uh, a lot of the youth coming up are okay with bowling on this hard stuff because uh, they're bowling on these sports shots. A lot of these concerns come from maybe the adult bowlers who are like, "Oh, we probably need to make it more easier." But I think it does have a lot to do with the fact that you're used to bowling on easier conditions. You're used to shooting two twenties, so you're your mind is already like set in, set in his ways where I should be shooting two twenties or two O's and stuff. And if I'm not doing that, I'm not bowling good. And that's really not the case. You know, you could be bowling the same on both patterns, except one is just harder. So you're going to be having lower score. You're still bowling. Well, there's a good chance you could bowl really good and average two O 
and bowl worse on a sports on a house shot, sorry, and average 220, and you, yeah, you'd be bowling worse. So it's it's all relative, but I think the youth these days, the culture coming up, is more dedicated to the fact that we'll bowl on harder patterns, we'll bowl on tougher conditions because we don't mind. We you want think? to challenge. Ourselves. I think so. I think I think so. I think you know. Back in the day, they didn't have those. You know, I always hear it from the older generation. We didn't have sports shots, and they just bowled on what was out there. You know, and and uh, and then there was a a generation, I think, you know, through the two thousands, uh, that just bowled on all these, you know, easier conditions. All these, you know, forties, fifties, maybe uh, in the thirties, late thirties. Uh, they just always want to bowl on the easier stuff. And I think youth these days, with all the tournaments, junior gold. You know, they're used to bowling on sport conditions, and that's what they. I think that's what they want to compete on. Yeah, I mean, even the pros want to bowl on harder stuff. But yeah, I, the 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 youth they they do. I I don't know. I think it. I think it. It would. It stinks if for youth bowlers to learn how to bowl on really harder stuff, and then if they decide to get to the professional level or a harder level, uh, and then they bowl on easier stuff. And it's like, wait, what? Like, I yeah. gotta average two forty now. I don't like this. Isn't what we've brought up doing, especially when you're watching guys like Belmont average like two fifty, and you're like, uh, yeah. What do I do? <laughs> so there's a there's a question in the chat. Uh, Casey U- Usugi, <laughs> sorry if I botched that. He goes after college. Yeah, I'll- <laughs> What's that? You definitely botched that. Yeah, I definitely botched. Well, that. I'm not gonna I apologize, try either. Casey. Uh, Casey said, "After college, the optimal time to go out on tour." Yeah, I think I think that's a little bit of a, you know, uh, your preference, your personal preference. I mean, like, so what your situation is, you know, are you a higher caliber college player, or do you need a little bit of work? You know, going out on tour is can be financially tough. It is financially tough. It's not can be. It is financially uh, hard to do. So if you're not ready for it. Um, it's hard to do, but with that being said, there's really no preparation for going on tour than actually going on tour. You know, some of the stuff you see out there, some of the moves, transitions, how to deal with certain situations, you can't really replicate those at home. You have to experience them on tour. So, you know, this, I think the sooner, the better, the more you can get into that learning curve, uh, the more you can, you know, you'll have more years ahead of you. If you wait till you're 30 to go on tour, but you could have, you know, learned in those earlier years, those are just less years you're going to be in your prime to really take advantage of that knowledge you gain from going out on tour. Yeah, I mean, there's no advantage to, when you get done with college, there's no advantage to waiting because that that period where you think you're going to practice and you're going to do all this stuff and you're going to work on your game, uh, that's not going to help. Because right. the tour is, is a whole different thing. So if you want to bowl on tour, just do it now. I mean, find a way yeah. to get the money. I mean, even if you spend a year practicing and doing everything you can or spending six months practicing or whatever, and you have to go out or you're putting up your own money or investors are putting up your money or whatever, the money is still um, – the value is still the same even if you take six months in practice because you're still n- not um, – as well versed with the tour and the tour is yeah. everything about the tour is just completely different than been practicing. So just get out there. I mean, if that's your dream, if that's what you want to do, sign up tomorrow. And even if you go hundred under 200 under finish at the bottom, then, then you, your job is to kind of figure out why you did that. And then you go home and practice. Right. So, yeah. But you don't really know what to practice or how to practice or what to get better at unless you see it. You got to see it. You got to get out there. You got to watch what these guys do and how they play lanes and um, nice. how they control their emotions and stuff like that. You got to see it for yourself. You got to get yourself in that situation before you can really. Yeah, the it. learning curve starts on tour. So, all right, we got yeah. a bunch of questions here. Yeah, I guess no, this is good. Let's run down these. I'll rifle through them. Um, uh, Brandon Westerfield says, I've talked to many pros and I've asked each one I've met to see what they prefer, surface or polish. Um, I think surface. You know, you can, we don't use polish too much because we use a lot of, there's a lot of oil on the lanes, but you know, it's really, ultimately it depends on what's out there, you know, but those harder conditions, we want to get the ball to see it sooner, uh, be able to get the ball to read that front to back better and service allows that ball to see the ball or to see the lane earlier. So 
I think generally surface is used more, you know, and obviously later in blocks we'll use some polish if we need to, but yeah. Uh, I've, I don't know. I don't know when polish is. I, I don't know the last time I saw polish actually look good. Yeah. I don't, I don't either. It's very rare. You know, it's there, especially when they put out so much oil, you got to use surface. So yeah. Um, um, what parts of your physical game do you work on the most? Uh, <sighs> man, that's, uh, that's a hard one. <laughs> I work on everything. I don't know. What do you do, Kyle? Yeah, well, you know when I practice. <laughs> I'm always on, Kyle works I'm on always, playing straight. <laughs> I'm always throwing it bad, so I have the, I have a bad mental like imagery of my game to where I always feel like I'm throwing it bad. So I'm always working on stupid crap, like stuff that when I sh- I just shouldn't be working on. But for the uh, for me, a lot of it's my footwork and my alignment. Uh, I have some like issues in my approach where I go some wrong directions or I kind of cross over too much. Then I bump out to the left. We might have a weed eater going. I don't know if you guys can hear that or not. I, I can't hear it. They might be able to hear it. They'll, they'll let us know. But um, anyway, I got some directional issues with my approach. So I work on my approach a lot. Yeah. I So like 10 months ago, a couple months before the World Series, I decided for the first time I was going to watch myself on film. And that was kind of a bad idea because now I've become obsessive over my every little thing Uh, and it's difficult to be your own coach. But the thing I, I think the thing I focus on the most is the direction of everything that's going on. So before, when I looked at my swing the first time or my, my game the first time in a long time, my feet were going left and then back to the right. And then my swing was going to the right and back to the left. And, and so now I just work on, I work on two things. I work on my body and swing, both of them going in, in the forward direction. I don't want anything like swearing off to the left and the right because I don't do that naturally. And I'm just, you know, that doesn't help me. Uh, and then like the forwardness, so the spine tilt. So I don't mm. want to get too far forward. So I work on just like the direction of everything. I want everything to be together, uh, compact. I want it to be efficient and I want it to all just go this way. Uh, and then my, my, my leaning as well. That's what I work on the most. All right. What is your, what's your first bowling ball? A Maxim, an Ebonite eight pound Maxim. I definitely had like a, I don't know if it was six or eight pounds, uh, a goofy plastic ball. And I had a matching goofy single ball tote to go with it. <laughs> Do you know your second ball? Uh, I think it was a, uh, I think I got a 10 pound flash flood wow <laughs> yeah a flash flood yeah dude i love that ball dang i threw i think i actually i think i had like probably a power groove before that i think they had like a brunswick power groove is what it was called and then i had a flash flood and then i had a pba tour pro am ball and they're all different weights i don't even know what that is it was like if you went to the pro am and you signed up for it they they, you had this ball, and I think it was supposed to be like an Inferno or something, but it just said PBA Tour on the side. Really? And it was 12, yeah, and it was twelve pounds. That's actually that's what I shot my first three hundred with. We still have it here. It's was like it a, a box. Was it a National Pro Am? No, it wasn't. I remember my pros where I had Ryan Schaefer in my pros. Uh, I think I had like Haugen in my pros. Uh, so they gave it for so for the Pro Am, it wasn't a national event, and they gave away a bowling ball. I can't remember if it was a national event or not. I, I, I don't know. But they gave away a PBA Tour uh, ball. It's red. And if I was closer to it, I'd go get it. It's sitting right inside. <laughs> yeah, my, my first one was an 8-pound Maxim and then a 10-pound Meteor, Storm Meteor. Do you remember the Meteor? Or were you too young? Nah, dude. Honestly, before like 2012, I know nothing about bowling balls. Like, <laughs> I got my one ball a year, it seemed like, and that was it. Yeah. A yeah. ten pound meteor, and then I think I had a, uh, I don't know, I had an El Nino two thousand. That's what it was. I think it was like twelve pounds. El Nino. Okay, what else we got here? What's your first ball? Uh, what is the furthest you guys have gone to bowl in a tournament? Um, Japan. I guess probably Japan and South Korea for me. So pretty, pretty long distances. Um, 
when and how do we book Brad and Kyle coaching sessions? Hey, we might be able to get to that in a little bit. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. We have we have something in the works. We're both trying to coach more, and we gonna, and we kind of found a passion for that. So I guess we'll get to that. So um, first, Brendan Pitt goes, it does take a completely different skill set to whack an easy pattern compared to a score to a scoring on sport. I've met guys who average 215 on sport – um, but have trouble hitting house, and who all and who all knows house hacks. So a completely different skill set. You know, I, I don't know how. I understand what he's trying to say. Yeah, me I, too. Um, but the principles a lot are still the same. You know, whether they're easy, whether they're hard. The only one of the big differences is when you're bowling on easier patterns, it's just easier for everybody to get to the pocket. You know, from all different angles. When you go on a harder condition, you normally can only get to the pocket from one angle. Just- yeah, I, there definitely is a, a skill set in terms of um, – yeah, there, there is a skill set. The problem I have with easier patterns, and I have a scenario where I was in I was in St. Louis for Tommy Rogers was running a tournament, and it was on a house shot. It was in um, – I don't know where it was, kind of like uh, in the middle of nowhere, bowling center – and we were down to the stepladder, and I was watching the stepladder. And Derek Matson was bowling Dan Lemish, I believe, and it came down to the 10th frame. And Derek Matson needed a double and, like, nine to win, to beat, Le- to beat Lemish to move on to the next game. And Derek Matson was throwing his Teal Rano Pro up, yeah. up the left side. And I thought to myself, like, wow, this is what bowling's all about right here. Uh, you need you need a double in the tenth to beat your opponent. Like it doesn't get any better than this. But I then I thought, well, it's just going to come down to carry because he's not missing the pocket. So the best scenario to me would be like, can he execute this shot? With but it's not a matter of execution because it doesn't matter how he executes it. Uh, it's still going to hit the pocket. So it becomes a matter yeah. of carry. And then I just right. didn't want to watch it. I was like, I don't even want to watch this right. frame right now because I know he's going to hit the pocket. And to, to be fair, there is still some like I field. Mean, there's a little execution, but there is like there's just not as much execution that goes into like if you're going on a tougher condition, you know. On house, it's like you get to the pocket, but the execution comes with that like feel or maybe speed, still getting the ball to kind of do closer to what you're uh, trying to get it to do to get it to carry. But there's just more room for error. So, um, yeah, there's definitely a thing. Uh, Casey posted in here, um, how, do you, how do you mentally cope with bad games? You know, I've heard uh, taking one shot at a time and leaving it behind, but what goes through your mind to prevent bowling bad the entire block? You know, like, for me, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm – Growing up, I wasn't the greatest. When I was a youth bowler, I kind of had a little bit of an attitude. Uh, when I was in college, I got pretty upset when I bowled bad. Um, you know, I haven't handled it the best in my. I handled it. I handle it well now, or I handle it better now. the The reason I handle it better is just because I've experienced every scenario you can possibly think of. I've bowled yeah. enough now, or I've I've shot every single type of one sixty you can shoot. I've shot every type of 279 you can shoot. I've shot, I've been in almost every scenario other than like a TV show. So it's like, I've just come to realize that I'm going to shoot 160. It's just going to happen. Um, the only thing I can c- control is if, um, you know, is if I shoot that 160 and I guess, or how I shoot that 160. So if I'm if I'm if I start off with three opens, then it's my job to do whatever I can to try and get back to 190 and 200. And if I don't do that, then so be it. Like it's it's gonna happen. You're going to do it. The the more you focus on the things that you have to do when you bowl a game, the more you focus on you know the adjustments and the ball choice and all that stuff. And the less you think about score, the better off you'll be. So that's that's what I do. Yeah, I know for the mental game with me, it's, it's definitely something I. I work on consistently. I struggle with like if anyone saw me bowl the uh, part, the midnight bowlers thing, dude, my mental game was so bad. Like, I was getting frustrated, really mad, did some things I regret. A lot uh, of people were, a lot of people were, you know, and, but the, the mental game and the physical game is two separate entities. Like you have to work on your mental preparation just as much as you work on, you know, physical game stuff. You know, you have to constantly 
remember to, uh, you know, in practice, like not get mad. How do you handle emotions? Put yourself in similar situations to you would see in competition and try to figure out how you would handle those. And then, and then when you're in the actual tournament, like have a goal in mind, have a goal. Like, I'm not going to get upset this tournament. I'm going to react this way when I do certain things. And then, you know, as soon as you pocket that seven ten on a double or something, tell yourself you're going to react a certain way. Tell yourself, okay, I'm going to throw that. I'm just going to come back calm, analyze the shot and then forget about it. And I think if you have that preparation of this is how I'm going to attack that situation, when that situation occurs, it's easier to deal with it. So, you know, it's just, you know, just practicing, practicing your mental game as much as the physical game. Cause it's not easy. I mean, I was a hothead, big hothead back in the day, kicking stuff, you know, doing all kinds of things, making a scene. And, and every now and then I still do it. Like I just, I have trouble controlling my emotions, but you know, the people that can control their emotions better usually prevail more than those who can. And I, th- I think that's controlling your emotions is harder than, you know, bowling good or shooting a good score. Cause there are times where you don't have to have your emotions in check to shoot a high score. You know, right. sometimes you can be steaming and still shoot 279 the next game. Um, but then there are also a lot of times where you shoot 150 because your emotions are out of check. I, I like to, I mean, there's guys, one guy in particular I really like to watch do what he's good at is Ricky Fowler in golf because it just doesn't matter what situation he gets himself into. He just handles it well. He's cool with it. Now, yeah. granted, you know, he, he he's obviously, you know, very successful. He's rich. Uh, he's, you know, everything you could ever want in that scenario as a golfer. Uh, so in reality, you know, there really is no reason for him to ever be upset ever really. Um, but, uh, you got to think that like when you're, when you're emotionally involved to, you know, the pressure that gets put on you to like perform well or whatever pressure you put on yourself, being able to handle those, the emotions when you do put pressure on yourself is hard. It is hard. It's very hard. Um, but it's essential. And the thing is, is like you can get so wrapped up in what's going on, the score you shoot, what's going on around you, uh, people getting lucky. You can get so wrapped up in the scenario at hand and what you're experiencing that you don't even think life outside of that is real anymore. Like you don't think about, okay, what happens when I leave this bowling center? Life goes on. It's just another day. Um, You know, everything's the same. You know, you still have your friends, you still have your family, you still have all these things that make your life great. Um, but, still you're not, still but, you're not, but you're not thinking about that when you're shooting 150. So, right. um, you know, potentially just make sure you continue to think about life as a big spectrum. I think I saw someone in the chat, like, don't think about game to game, think of it as a block. Well, yeah, that's good. Think of it as a block. If you shoot 150, you know, you can still shoot 250 to recover. Uh, but yeah, also don't think of it as just one small scenario. You have to continue to think that life is just much bigger than what that little thing you're just doing. All right. Mark says, uh, working on changing my release. Uh, I have been working with a coach. Will you guys be doing any more videos dealing with bowling release and what things help to improve your release? Yeah, we're, dude, we, uh, instructional videos have been going great. That's kind of an avenue that we wanted to explore for a while. We're starting to do it now. Um, yeah, we're planning on, re- like, this becoming a pretty weekly, hopefully it turns into maybe a bi week or a twice a week thing. So, um, yeah, tons of videos coming out. Stay tuned. We'll be we'll be putting a lot of stuff out there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So and guys, give us a little love on the Rev Ray video. Yeah. <laughs> there will be there will be more coming out on Rev Ray. We just wanted to give, you know, with some of the time that we had to make the video, we just wanted to give a pretty simple, um, uh, basic idea of like one of the motions to generate Rev Ray. But yeah, there's a lot of you guys are right. There's so much more that goes in the rev rate, which we will be talking about in the near future. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so bowling, there's a – go ahead. Uh, if, you, hey, if you're a manager of a PBA league team, who will you pick for your team? Who would you pick for your team? I uh, guess – What's the scenario? I don't know. Maybe do – do uh, if you had to – I don't know. That's a – I don't know what the scenario is. Say you had to pick your first player. And every, uh, everyone's open? You know, everyone's open. You know, even like, I guess you got to take out, I don't know, don't take out anyone. Who would be, if you, ideally, everyone's open, first player, who would Norm, you pick? Norm Duke. Yeah, man. <laughs> it doesn't, 
it just doesn't get any better than Norm Duke. He's a no. he's a super guy. He's a phenomenal player. He's the one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. He'll he'll do everything in his power to make sure you're comfortable. He'll do everything in his power to make sure you're ready and prepared. He'll just do things for you. He's fun to be around. He's a great person to be around. I don't know. Norm all the way. Yeah, I'm 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 biased, but I'm definitely uh, yeah. picking picking Norm. <laughs> I mean Kyle's team in general, just those four guys. Oh my god. For the strikers. I'll just take those four guys all day long. So, um, um, second, okay. I don't know. Uh, if if Norm Duke's hurt, yeah, who would be second? I think I'm picking. Like, I'm going down my list of my team, and I'm just picking that. I know, because <laughs> like they're just so experienced. Like, there's not a situation that that those guys haven't seen, and even if they don't come through, you know, there's not going to. There's always a deep thought process in all like situations that those guys will get in, and there's not going to be like, oh crap, haven't seen this. What do we do? Oh, you go throw the shot. No, there's there's a thought process. Yeah, we might not win, but there's at least a thought process going into it. So I, um, I mean, Bill O'Neill is high on my list. I think Chris Barnes is high on my list for some reason. I don't yeah. know why Barnes. I I find Barnes to be well, really funny. It's Barnes, dude. Like, I, <laughs> gotta be high. He's, a, he's an amazing bowler, but there's something about Barnes that makes me laugh, and so <laughs> I just uh, probably him. Uh, Dennis talks about uh, at the bottom of swing. What do you feel on your fingers and your thumb? Um, I guess real quick, without going too much into that, you know, obviously your thumb comes out first, and you wanna. You want to have a good separation of timing between your thumb coming out and feeling your fingers rotate through the ball. Uh, but in general, we want fast hand motion through that process as well. So, like, I don't feel my fingers and thumb too much, but you want to have that good separation timing of your fingers, your thumb coming out and then your fingers coming through. Yeah, fingers over thumb. You don't want to feel your thumb. Yeah, you don't want to feel your thumb because that's that's grab. And yeah. You, don't want, you want to so. feel it come off your fingers. So. Thoughts on uh, lowest hooking ball on the market right now? Two hander and low oil condition on most lanes around town. I don't know, just the low end. You know, that's something that's something I've struggled with a little bit with like uh, a couple of my uh, students is they they bowl on house shots around here, and a lot of the house shots hook. And I don't really know a proper technique or ball because sometimes when you see a lot of hook it's better to drill something strong and let it roll out um but then again you know the the weaker stuff likes to hook a lot down lane and that can be bad too so i don't i don't have like a, a perfect response to how do you i don't know if a low end ball is the the best choice there but i i guess it depends on exactly like low oil what does that mean like where's it hooking yeah. how's it hooking i don't know it depends like i i i struggle using some low end equipment cuz the way i want to see the lane but i drilled up a couple low end balls actually recently and they they were okay so which ones um ebis came out with a new one um i think it's announced i don't even know if Should it's we not? <laughs> yeah, let's not even go there Let's just avoid that. But the new low end ball, I've been giving it a go, and I actually kind of like it. So <laughs> I think it is announced. I think I'd be all right saying it, but we'll just we'll just leave it there. Yeah, I just drilled a um, Casey Maddenly goes, "Come on, Brad, hustle link." I just drilled one, and I've only thrown it like fifteen shots of St. Charles, so I don't it's know much toast. about it. And it's toast. Yeah, the cover shot's <laughs> gone on it. All right. Um, hey, uh, Mike. Mike's in the chat. He gave us a uh, a shout out. Hi guys, super proud of what you've been able to accomplish on the channel in such a short time. Thanks, Mike. You know, yeah. he, Mike's been, you know, kind of a little bit of a mentor for us because he's, you know, in the social media game and he does a lot of research. So, and he has his big YouTube channel. So, you know, he's helped us a lot with questions. So, thanks, Mike, for the compliment there. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, and learning how to edit video and get yeah, over that's the, the process. Oh, man. All right, <laughs> Livio, does Brad throw a man weight? Yes, I throw 15. <laughs> That's not man weight. Look at him. You can't throw man weight. Heck no, I'm thinking about going to 14. <laughs> I know. I've thought about throwing 16. Then I throw eight games with my 15-pound ball. I'm like, screw that. That sounds terrible. 
can't even imagine what my wrist would do. Manny who can Lee goes, it, what's that? Oh, who can loft it more down the lane? Not me. <laughs> Brad's loft game is weak. <laughs> I'm the worst lofter on the planet. It, it might be. We've definitely gotten to this scenario at a couple like ends of some doubles tournaments where if Brad could just loft the ball like past the arrows, we would crush it. And Brad just can't loft it down. There. I mean, I can loft it, it down there. It, yeah, it's more it's so just the not angle. proper. Yeah, it's like the angle at which you loft. <laughs> It's just like you know, you just you don't repeat shots very well from there. But I think it probably has to do like you're short. You got these short T Rex. Yeah, I mean, arms. I, I got these T Rex arms. It's hard to like project it going down there. But I think I think a lot of it has to do with uh, my timing a little bit. I think I have a little bit of early timing going get to the release. Yeah. And it makes me grabby instead of me like projecting it down the lane. I'm like kind of grabbing it and throwing it down the lane. And that if any. Doesn't matter where you're playing on the lane. If you're grabbing it, it's not going to go very good. So, to be fair, how often do you practice watching it in practice? Never. Exactly. So that's probably one of the reasons you're like. Do you? Make- but yeah. Yeah, but I spent an entire college career lofting it. That's all we ever bowled on, and I was pretty good at it then. It's been a long time since then. That's you. You've been like seven, six I years, know. six years graduated. I know. I just I need to get better right. at it. Uh, have have both of you bowled the Peterson Classic? Not well, not this year. Brad I've, Brad doesn't like the Peterson. I've bowled it once. He's salty. Yeah, I shot fifteen oh eight and didn't cash, or like fifteen oh six and didn't cash, or whatever. Which is pretty crazy. I it's don't I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a fun tournament. I just uh, looking at like the schedule and the amount of tournaments I bowl. I just don't ever put it in the schedule. I'd like to go bowl, but I just don't ever yeah. go out of my way to I do it. I think I'm bowling in about a month. So, yeah. Um, um, so, Vols fans said, Brad, just watched your video of your league team say the national record years ago. How much fun was that night? And that has to be the highlight. Look back on your smile, right? Or look on with a smile, right? Yeah, man. The, the, the cool part about that was it was a team thing. I have four guys that I experienced that with, and we talk about it. We know the exact date we did it. We, uh, we're not together anymore, like, location-wise. So, But we used to have a party every November 30th. It was uh, – the cool part also was the people who had it had the record beforehand was Randy Lightfoot, our bowling coach, our college bowling coach. He had the record with uh, John Weber and a couple other St. Louis guys. Who else was on the team? Uh, was Johnny Lay on that team? Maybe Johnny Lay. Um, I don't know. But it was set at St. Charles Lanes, and then we broke it down the street at Harvest Lanes. And so the second we broke it, you know, we called Randy and said, hey, we broke your record. He was super excited. It was, um, I don't know. It's it's not something you th- ever think that you could do or dream of. Uh, and then when it happened, it was it was amazing. It was, it was super cool. And we're thankful that Flanagan got it on camera. That was when Flanagan first started his whole, like, video spiel of, like, inside bowling. That was when inside bowling first started. And so Flanagan edited it for us. He, he videoed it and edited it, and it just worked out awesome. That's cool. Yeah, it was uh, – and also I'm, I'm wanting to figure out a way I can get all four of them on a podcast one day. Uh, and then we just hang out because I'd like for you, I like for an audience to get to know those guys because uh, they're really good friends of mine and they're uh, they're awesome. So yeah. So one PB, uh, so Casey, one PBA fifty. I want to talk about the people. Did you see uh, Mika won the PBA fifty senior yeah. masters? What? <laughs> Crazy. Like, I didn't even really know he was still bowling. I mean, I'm still sure in, but like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, these guys, man, like, it's a bad time to be on the PBA 50 tour if you're not one of those legends. Because, like, all right, well, I just joined the PBA 50 tour. Now I still have to compete against Pete, Norm, Mika, Brian Voss, Parker Bone, Walter Ray, like, the greats of the sport. And I got to bowl against them every week. Screw I know. That. Um, and then Brian Voss is in the step ladder, too. Dude, Brian <laughs> Voss, this is how good these guys are. And this really puts it in perspective – uh, what you kind of need to be able to compete on tour. But Brian Voss last year didn't throw a ball for six months. And there was a regional in Colorado Springs. And he shows up. It's close to his house. He shows up, and it's a big regional. It pays five grand. There's a lot of really good players there. And he wins. And they were really hard. It was on like 
40 foot, kind of flat. He hadn't thrown a ball for six months. He shows up and he wins, and he beats Frankie Lavoie in the finals, and he beat me in the semifinals. And it's like, man, that's how good those guys were and still are. Is you can not touch a ball for six months and still compete at a high level because of how much they did it, how often they did it, and how good they got at it. Yeah, that's insane. It's like Mika. I, he, I could, what? There's no way. If I don't throw a ball for six months, I know. I don't even know where it's going. But if think, I don't throw a ball for three weeks. But think about think about how much we bowl. We don't bowl nearly as much as those guys did. True. Those yeah. that's all those guys did for twenty years. Yeah. So I mean, that's all they did week after week. They bowled fifty games a week for twenty years at a at a high level at a high level of competition. So, um, cool. What is the way to make the tour? Uh, just sign up. Just go on to PBA and get a membership for twenty five bucks a month, and you can do whatever you want. Yeah, they have like a couple different memberships you can get, but yeah, pretty simple. Um, you know, there's some couple requirements you have to have, but nothing crazy. No bowl expo? No, nah, we're not going to bowl expo. Uh, we'll be at Junior Gold though. So, um, Peter Fox goes, thank you guys so much for the podcast. He's the only bowling podcast that I can find very knowledgeable players on tour. Your whole channel is great for beginners and advanced skill levels. Yeah. Thank you. When we started out, uh, this channel, we wanted to make vlogs and we were inspired to make vlogs. And so that what was good is we learned how to edit video. We're not great at making vlogs, but we're definitely better now than we were a year ago. Uh, and then we, we've recently branched out and changed the channel a little bit. The podcast thing. It's in the works. It's growing right now. The the format we can use right now is a format you're looking at. Um, but hopefully next year we'll be able to set set up an actual podcast. And while we're out on tour, we can get some tour guys uh, to sit down with us and actually have a podcast to where we're all in the same room, uh, which is what I think. But with that yeah. being said, the the goal the goal the entire goal of the channel is to just educate uh, and then grow bowling. We want like the entire sport to grow along with our channel and so um so yeah we thought having conversations like we're doing right now um would help the sport a lot and with that being said i'm podcasting with sean rash next wednesday at noon so uh that'll be like the first like big household name that we have on the podcast and i'm really looking forward to it so yeah i guess when we our our channel started with just the vlogs and now especially with the tour, it's going to give us a lot of time for content. We're going to be actually with each other for a while. So we're going to be able to work on stuff, but I guess the whole vlogs, podcast, uh, instructional kind of direction of where the channel is going. So, and it's, and it's a lot of fun making these instructional videos has been a lot of fun. Podcasting is a lot of fun and will be a lot of fun, especially when it becomes more legit. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the channel. So, Chris Rains, are you ready for Syracuse? Um, yeah, I'm going to Syracuse in Thursday. I leave tomorrow, so that'll be fun. You leave tomorrow? Yeah. I don't, you have, don't you have a lesson at two o'clock? No, I have a lesson at four. Okay. Um, are we excited about yeah. the new Fox deal? Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's. Yeah. I think it's going to be amazing. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Ex- I mean, amazing is a crazy word. Is it gonna? Is the PBA tour gonna be like super huge, bowling every week for hundreds of thousand dollars? I don't know. I don't even know if that's possible. Uh, but what we do have with this Fox deal is structure, and I hope that um, the more the, I hope it just becomes a lot of structure, and I hope the players uh, can feel more at home with supporting the PBA. I hope they feel like they can be a part of something more so than it has been. Um, I feel, I hope that it, it can be more understandable to try and bowl for a living. I hope it can be a better destination to do that. I don't know. I hope, I hope it all increases with this Fox deal. I hope Fox, uh, and the PBA develop a really, really good relationship for years to come. And then it becomes great. I don't know. Yeah. We're excited. I think all the bowlers are really excited. All of them are excited. I think so. So. All right, well, you want to rifle through some of these questions and then get to, like, talking about our channel a little bit? Yeah, let's do it. So, uh, have you guys ever thought about having collegiate bowlers on the player interviews? Uh, 
you know, we haven't, we haven't had the opportunity yet, but you know, it's not something where we'd be, Against, uh, yeah. Against at all. We're, like, we're, we're down for promoting bowling. So if we can time it right and, you know, we get to do these interviews when we're together and then we're with the people we're with. So we, we don't really have the luxury of sometimes being in all everyone in the same location all the time. So but yeah, right. we do it. No problem. So, um, Brad, how many times have you shot multiple 300s in a qualifying round? You shot two 300s at Poplar Creek? Yeah. In a qualifying round? Uh, no. One 300 was in qualifying. One 300 was in uh, the, uh, the round robin. So two 300s in a day. Huh. One... One in two different rounds. I don't know of. if I've ever done that. Maybe I've done it. Maybe I haven't. I don't know. That's. I think I've done it like three times. But that's it. Three times. That's, that's two three hundreds in the same tournament. Good yeah. Grief. I don't think I have three three hundreds. Period. Dude, I like the coolest thing about one of those three hundreds at Poplar. Craziest three hundred I've ever had. Front six. I'm throwing my seventh shot, and as I'm releasing the ball, my sleeve comes out and gets stuck in my hand. The ball goes up and lands on the lane going about 10 miles an hour down the lane. And when it goes down the lane, it's like kind of shaping and dead flush in the pocket with like with the sleeve out. And you had the front seven? And I had the front six. That was for my seventh one. And then you switched balls? No. So then I go glue. I get my thing glued in i come back after about like 10 minutes go brooklyn my next shot and then proceed to strike out for 300 was that was i there yeah you got third at that tournament okay i lost to you aj yeah. I lost you lost to, you. to me <laughs> yeah great moment of my life <laughs> all right uh i don't know let's talk about patreon all right, yeah, so I guess we can disclaim it more to the fact that we want to get into coaching more. Yeah. And Patreon's kind of an avenue. We can do that along with all of our other stuff. So we learned about this Patreon through the guy, the CEO. Um, he made a vlog about Casey Neistat, and it went viral. And so when we saw Patreon, we saw that it was – you could get you could create a channel like a not a youtube channel but it's like patreon helps creators i guess if you're making videos for youtube um have another avenue of revenue if you can build it that way so we looked into it and we thought it was pretty cool so we could create an account so if you haven't been to patreon or know what patreon is or not familiar with it uh, go to patreon.com it's p-a-t-r-e-o-n um, there's several YouTubers that are on the platform, uh, and we just started. We just started our page. So, if you go to Patreon and type in Brad and Kyle, um, you know that'd be really cool. Yeah, I'm gonna post a link here. But yeah, so we we've kind of found. You know, we've been coaching a lot more ourselves in this home, uh, in our respective bowling alleys, and I think it's kind of a passion we've grown. We really like doing it, um, and it's cool. You know, just helping changing bowling, improving people's lives through bowling. Uh, it's pretty cool. It, it's been very rewarding for us. And we kind of want to figure out a way to expand that, you know, as much as we can so we can maybe do it full time. Uh, and this Patreon site is kind of an avenue to do that. You know, it, we, we see it as a site to where we can help give, you know, bowling tips. We're going to do like special podcast videos on there, um, blogs, uh, just a way to build a community on this site for people that want to support us and, uh, and then interact with them, you know, and there's different, uh, there's different things we can, we can do. There's different like levels of what you want to, you know, contribute. But our goal is we want to be able to do this full time. Uh, Patreon's a site to where hopefully we can make that happen. You know, we're not, this isn't like something we're trying to get rich. We just want to be able to do this. Cause we're always, you know, going on tour is really tough financially. And uh, you know, we're always contemplating the idea or the realism of, possibly having to like, you know, not do as much, maybe get a job or something. And our goal is to not have to do that and 
pursue a career in coaching in bowling, stay within the sport yeah, and just in the industry in general. Yeah. That way we can keep, keep trying to improve the sport, you know, in our own way. Uh, so let me see if I can get, you know, and I think, I think right now what we're trying to do with the YouTube page is untouched ground. Everything we do, we're just learning because no one else does it. And so, um, trying to figure out how to do all this stuff, try to figure out how to build a YouTube page, try and figure out how to build a Patreon page, try and figure out how to get paid doing it. Cause we haven't made a dime. Um, that's all un uncharted territory. We right. virtually have no idea what we're doing with any of this. So we're just we're also trying to build a foundation that like we can like there's like like I said, if you when you graduate college and you want to try and pursue bowling, um, you know we can provide help for you to do that. And so we're just uh, you know we're just trying to grow and figure out how to do all this stuff and yeah, have fun doing it, I guess yeah and we we've we've experienced so basically with patreon do we explain exactly what patreon is but i don't think so 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 it's like it's it's this site you go on you have your you have your page and it's it's a really like personal site it's kind of like a it's kind of like a facebook or youtube channel um it's very similar and so to become a patron of like our site uh, you would have to donate money, and then, but each time you donate money, there's different levels, there's different tiers of what they call it. And when you have these tiers, so we'll have one that's like a dollar a month. If you do a dollar a month, we're gonna have special. Uh, you're gonna be able to interact with our Brad and Cal community on there. You're gonna have, uh, yeah. What do we say we're doing? Um, interact for the dollar a month. Yeah. Uh, you get access to our vlogs and material yeah. before, and you get shout outs in the podcast. Yeah. And then we're going to be shout outs to the podcast for a dollar a month. You get to be on the community page. Where we'll be posting like tips that maybe we won't be posting on other social media outlets. Uh, and, um, and then you get shout outs in the podcast. So just for a dollar a month, you get all of that. And I think for, for what are we doing? $10 a month. We're going to have like Brad and Kyle merchandise, which is going to be like shirts, mugs, uh, with different sayings, maybe our logos and stuff. And you get one of those every three months. So you get all that, um, like the shout outs, internet access, or, or interact with us, internet access, shout outs on the weekly podcast, interact with us on the blogs, uh, and podcast topics, instructional videos, and merchandise for only $10 a month. Uh, and then we have two more tiers of 50 and 200 that are like, you know, more in depth stuff, but right. uh, for the most part, like the, the dollar a month one, it, it, you basically just become a part of the page and we're going to be posting just anything. We can post a blog, we can post a little video, we can post a little tip, we can post a little anything, um, to, to hopefully help you or, you know, l- let you enjoy the material that we give you, or maybe you get better or just whatever. Yeah. So and it's all new, so we'll we'll continue to build it and continue to listen to you guys and uh, see how how we need to do things and how to go about things and so yeah, it'll be good. Yeah, I know for the the fifty dollar a month one is gonna be more in depth. We'll actually provide uh, like a twenty. We're gonna provide a twenty minute uh, personal coaching session via some online outlet uh, with us. So every month you get a twenty minute. This can be like a mentoring. Uh, just talking about topics. Uh, we can get some videos of your game and diagnose what we see out of it and what could be done. Uh, plus, you get all the other stuff. So, um, yeah, it's cool. It's some we're trying out. You know, stuff may change here and there, but we want to develop some outlets to where, you know, we can interact with our audience more, become more personable with them, and just try to help them out more. And I, I, this is a good avenue to do it, um, I think. So, that because, you know, in our on our page and our community, it's just going to be patrons of ours. You know, it's just going to be people on there that are specifically, you know, into uh, like whatever we're providing, you know, it's not going to be like a Facebook where kind of everyone can see it and chime in. No, like for the patrons, if you're not, you know, devoted to like, you know, um, what we're trying to create, then, then you can't be, you can't like put negative comments on there, all this other stuff, you know, right. there's not going to be any of that. So it's going to be cool. Hopefully we can build a little community on there. Uh, and like I said, we're coming out with a lot more content to throw on there for you guys. Uh, but yeah, that's an avenue we're trying to create. Um, 
So I so. think the, we like the coaching side, man. The coaching is fun. Uh, seeing someone improve, helping them change their game, and then working with them to do that is one of the coolest experiences that I've. Oh yeah, for sure. I had a lesson with a kid, uh, uh, a, a young, a young man, I should say. Uh, Henry from Nashville this last week and drove all the way up from St. Louis uh, from Nashville to come to St. Louis. And it was so cool to work with them. It's, it's, like working with people that are so, uh, that love the sport so much, have so much passion and want to get better. Uh, it's just, it's inspiring to me. Like I wasn't going to bowl that day. I bowled that uh, midnight bowlers thing the night before and I was tired. But after working with him all day and seeing his worth that day, I practiced right after the lesson. <laughs> I was like, man, I, I want to get better. So it was cool. You know, it helps us out a lot. It inspires us. So, yeah. yeah. And I think it's, it's neat. I mean, it's one thing for a guy to coach. I think it's cool for youth bowlers to get coached by people that see what the high level people do. I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm high level. I'm saying that I watch people who are high level, <laughs> and and I get to I get to know what they do. And so um, I think it's a good opportunity for youth um, to take advantage of coaching from people who watch the best in the world do what they do as well. Right. Yeah. I think we can provide. I feel like we provide a good insight. We're Pretty still learning perspective. To get better yeah. Ourselves. But we basically now you know we've experienced bowling almost on like pretty much every level. Like we've experienced, you know, not maybe not as much international play, but youth bowling from your local tournaments to maturing the junior gold to, you know, bowling a little bit more bigger youth tournaments to going to college bowling there to trying to get on tour, bowling big amateur tournaments. You know, we, we're starting to experience all of these spectrums. And then I think that's an insight that we can really give people through our yeah. experience. And we've experienced like college bowling. Like, there's a lot of people that ask me uh, what college is and what's college bowling like. Is it worth it? And what should you focus on? And like, depending on the person, you know, I can offer advice on that as well. So can you? Just yeah, every every avenue of bowling we've experienced. So we just want to try and continue that and you know educate people. Absolutely. So yeah, Patreon. It's gonna be something we're doing, uh, and also with the instructional videos, we got. Uh, We've had a lot of good feedback. We love the feedback that you guys are giving to us from those. Um, and we're, we're listening to your comments. Like all those topics that you guys are bringing up, like we plan on making videos for all like topics suggested because, you know, our goal from them is to help you guys. You know, we're um, – that, I mean, that's the goal. So, <laughs> Yeah, and we'll just, we'll just see. It's just another project of ours, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, so, so yeah, if you can, yeah. check out Patreon.com. Look up Brad and Kyle. Yeah, we're starting it out. It's new. We have we have no patrons yet. We just made this, so it's uh, it's a new site to everyone in general. Like, not many people know about it. Uh, but yeah, check it out if you want to help us out. Cool. We're gonna be doing some more stuff on there, along with our actual YouTube channel. So, um, anyway, let's. I think we wanted to talk about uh, the Midnight Bowlers tour, right? Yeah, we can talk about it. So maybe that we'll talk about that and then. Probably wrap it up a little bit. Wrap it up. So um, Danny, Danny Spink, I had him. Our last podcast uh, was with Danny Spink, and Danny Spink ran a tournament this past Friday night. It started at 10 p.m. It's called the Midnight Bowler Society, and he, it was 10 games, thousand dollar entry, paid out thousand dollars first place each game, and four hundred twenty five dollars second place each game. So it was basically just like a big action match, uh, and then he paid out the top three spots at a thousand dollars each. So I think the big winner was EJ Tackett. He walked away with four thousand dollars. Tim Barron walked away with twenty eight fifty. I think I saw. Shea left with I don't know maybe Michael Holloman was third. Left with like two grand. Shea left with like seventeen hundred. Yeah, eighteen hundred. Eighteen hundred. Um, something like that. But it was a it was a new type of tournament that for everyone to bowl. No one's ever bowled something like that. No one's ever bowled something with that high of an entry fee either. I I don't think uh, like. I guess there, if, there. not not people our age. If you were around for like the high rollers and stuff, yeah. Yeah. But, so it was really cool. It was it was during the night, and also it was on a, an extremely hard pattern, and also it was it was broadcasted on Twitch, which was I believe the first time bowling has ever been on Twitch. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of any other yeah. person who's streamed on Twitch. So maybe it could become something big on Twitch, but 
Um, yeah, it was a, it was an awesome experience. Danny Spink did a really good job. He got people in that bowling center. There were a lot of people in that bowling center to watch at nine thirty at night on a Friday night. Oh yeah, probably a hundred. Oh, more than that, I think. I mean, there was it was packed. I mean, everyone, everyone was there drinking, was hanging cool. out, having a good time. It was fun. Yeah, I think we got to commend Danny for having this oh, vision, 100%. putting it on. Like, it, he deserves so much respect for that. You know, he he's a guy that he, he's a really he's an advocate for growing bowling um, in any which way possible. He's doing a lot for the sport in his own way, and uh, you know, putting on this event was freaking sweet. I think uh, you know everything about it was cool. Uh, but you definitely had to give him the respect for, you know, create an event that was fun to watch. So people would come watch. it. I think sometimes in bowling, you know, we have these events where, you know, it's really quiet, you know, you want to let the players concentrate, but it's not fun for the people. Like, like it's fun when you can have a beer, get loud, cheer people on, yell when something happens and go from there. And that's, that's fun. And, uh, I think, uh, I think, you know, trying to get more atmospheres like that is, is, is a good thing for the sport. And Danny definitely hit it out, hit it, hit it out of the park with the midnight bowlers. You story. know, when people, people say that watching people not strike is boring. Like watching people shoot 170 is boring. I don't know, man. I think the people were pretty entertained Friday night. Hell yeah. Because as soon as someone was shooting like a 220 or a 240, it was monster. You're like, Holy shit! Like if like someone has crazy. a three, if someone has a three bagger, you're like, whoa, what's going on? Like he can win in the fourth frame. If like if you have a th- if you have three strikes out of the first four frames, you're ahead. You're ahead of everyone else. You're, you're hyped. <laughs> like the chances so you, of you, you started like, off with the lead. Yeah, like you're you you probably have a twenty. Pin <laughs> yeah, because like, there's usually one person that maybe starts with the first three, and I'm sure there were games where no one did. Right. Like. The first, the first high game was 211. And the second high game was what, like 220? I think Shea had 220. Yeah, Shea, the- Shea, I think Shea, I think this is low Shea in here. I don't know. No, Shea, I don't know. Who's low Shea? I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, he just said there was one 250-plus game, which I think was EJ Taggett. That's crazy. That's awesome. And you were winning thousands of dollars. The cool thing about it is each game – was like winning a tournament. And when you were coming down to the wire, if you were in the if you were in the hunt for any of those games, it was like when it was like that situation of winning a tournament. And you got to experience that, you know, ten times. You know, every game starting a tournament is like the championship match. Yeah. So it was awesome, man. It was it was cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I hope, you know, it grows. I hope there's I hope he gets forty people next time. I don't. I don't see him running another event this year, though. Um, maybe, maybe next year. But, yeah, you uh, know, I don't think it's something that needs to be ran all the no, time. No, definitely not. It could just be something that you mark on your calendar. It's kind of like the proprietor's cup. You just mark it on your calendar, and you know you're going to go to it. So. Yeah, and then I think you know, especially with an event like that, you want to do it right, and I, you don't want to rush in anything. You don't want to try to run five of them if they run, you know, not to their fullest. Uh, you, I think a couple of them a year, big action matches, getting people doing it right. You know, a lot of the money raised there was uh, towards the junior events, was our towards youth bowling. So that was really cool to see. Um, but yeah, you know, I think running a couple of those a year uh, and just filling the stands and giving them, making them events for people to go to. That's yeah. one of the things you know, people want to dilute, dilute everything with like, if they run one a good event, they want to run six of them a year. Yeah, exactly. It's the, you know, the, uh, I don't know what word is the, you know, it's not as rare, you know, if it's, if it's only happening once a year, it's saturated. Yeah. Really excited to go to it. Yeah. So, and, and I mean like, so the worst you can do is lose a thousand dollars. The best you can do, we'll say you can win maybe $3,000, maybe $4,000, but yeah. But I mean, even if you, okay. So if you put up a thousand bucks, if you have a thousand dollars to do so, um, and you go in there and stink, it's okay because you learn something. Or you can learn something. The pattern is so hard that you learn something. Um, for me, for me in my experience, I have a similar experience to that. I had one game over 200 and it was a 202. And I think total I was 270 under. It's probably the worst I've, I've mm, maybe not ever bowled, but one of the worst tournaments I've ever bowled uh, score-wise. Uh, right. But but I still loved it. I loved the experience. I thought it was I thought it was great. I went home knowing what I needed to work on. 
it was a it was a wonderful experience so when the conversation comes up with that pattern you know man you can learn so much by bowling on them when they're hard ah oh, you can just learn so much about yourself and your game yeah and that's one thing you i that's one, how much you actually repeat shots i mean i dude i spent 10 games not knowing how to strike 10 games in a row i had i not one single game not one single six frame stretch did i know this is what i needed to do i was 10 games straight of confusion um and that's cool that's okay right. like you have to that's fine you know you just go and work on stuff but people people don't ever experience stuff like that because they're so used to being able to strike that that's the bowling they know. Well, try going three or four games without literally a clue of how to double. Um, and then you'll really see yeah. what bowling's about. In my opinion, that's really bowling to me. Or the best form yeah. of bowling, I would say. I agree. We got, yeah, uh, it, was a, it was a great tournament, Danny Spink. Uh, I think right now he's trying to... What's he trying to do? He's promoting Bowl U. So Bowl U um, is coming into town... I don't know when they're going into St. Louis. Maybe St. Louis. August. It's like it's it's end of August or uh, mid to late August. Yeah. So Maybe. and Bolu Bolu is a company coaching foundation founded by Rick Benoit. Rick Benoit's probably one of the smartest, most genius guys in bowling. Brad mm-hmm. Angelo is running it for him. I don't know if Rick's going to be there or not, but but Brad Angelo is also an extremely smart guy when it comes to coaching. So if you're interested, you will learn, if you want to go to bowl you, you will learn a lot about the game in a different way than you ever would. And I think from that experience alone, it's worth it. So I would try, if you're looking into getting better at bowling to support bowl you in St. Louis at the end of August. And it's for all age groups, like young, you know, to, to old, like if you're, you know, if you're in your fifties, you can still learn a lot. In fact, I think if someone who has decreased power, maybe you can't do what you used to be able to do, you actually need bowl you even more to learn angles, to learn, to get your ball to do certain things, to increase your carry percentage. And so I actually think, you know, it's good for everybody, but it's especially important for those who maybe can't, comp- who, who can't rely on their power or speed they have to do it more with their, uh, you know, lane play and knowledge of manipulating their game. You know, it's even more important for those people. Right. So I know uh, in the chat here, Casey Baggingly said, I'm north of Indy. I'll give away lineage. I'd love to host one. Yeah, Casey, that's, I mean, that's, that's Danny's baby. You know, maybe it can grow into something where he hosts a few of them a year in different locations. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's a way where you could sell all the action and stuff, but you know, we'll see. It's the first one went really well. Um, we'll have to, uh, it's going to have to be a lot of strategic planning to see where it goes from there. But yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. He says, do you think the scores would have been higher if you could have used more than more balls other than those two chosen? Not really. I mean, I think it would have been maybe a little bit higher, but for the most part, you know, people pretty much locked in the balls they were going to use. I think for me, if I would have chosen other ball, it would have been urethane. And I think my total overall score would have been higher. I don't think I would have been 270 under. I might have been maybe 100 under or something, but I can't yeah. promise that I would have shot 230. You know, I might have yeah, just yeah. turned my 150s into 190s. But I love the two ball rule. I think it was really cool. Yeah. Because it the, the point of the tournament is shot making and, you know, learning how it's, uh, you know, you're bowling on all, all, the, all the variables are against you as far as, trying to shoot a really high game and you still have to shoot a high game. So I think yeah. that was really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, Some good information for junior gold. I don't know. You got anything good for junior gold? Hell yeah. <laughs> um, no, junior gold. Go to Patreon. Pretty- you'll learn a lot about that $200 a month thing. You learn a lot about junior gold. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Pay 200 a month. Now that's crazy if anyone does that, but they will get their game analyzed by us on an actual video. So yeah. That'd be yeah, cool. cool. Kind of cool. But anyway, junior gold, you know, this close to the tournament, you got to practice every day. You have to be, you know, preparing, pick your spares. You know, it's easy. It's really easy to say that, but it is true. So making sure you're confident on your spares, but also like your mental game. I think your mental preparation going to that tournament is one of the biggest things. If you understand how, to bowl junior gold, you can succeed a lot better. If you understand how to deal with certain situations, you know, 
not getting down. Understand that if you shoot 150 the first game of the tournament, you essentially have a 16 game tournament, I believe is what it is now. 16 yeah. game. Yeah. So, you know, it's almost like you have a 16 game block. So understanding that, you know, if you have a bad block, you have three other blocks to bring it up. And if you keep yourself in it throughout the 16 games, uh, you're prob you're, you're, you definitely have a better chance to be where you want to be. Um, you know, instead of getting mad at where you're at. So. Yeah, when it comes when it comes to youth bowlers and junior gold, well, I guess when it comes to bowlers in general, there's people who naturally get it. So there's people who the natural, pure natural way they bowl is fairly correct, and um, it allows them to get better a lot quicker. And then there's people who naturally throw the ball incorrect, and then it needs a lot of a lot of tweaks, a lot of changing, a lot of practice um, right. just to get the desired ball motion that you need. But one thing I can say is if your ball isn't going down the lane the right way now, if you're not if you're not able to shoot 220s on hard patterns, if you're struggling with spares, if you're struggling with anything, um, you're not where you need to be. Because when you go out to junior gold, there are people that bowl that tournament that are where they are where they need to be and their games are really really good. Um, and so if you're stuck, if you're averaging maybe 2-0 in your house shot league, or if you're missing some spares, or if you're just not quite sure how to play certain patterns, you're behind the curve. And, and you, you shouldn't expect to go out to junior gold and, and do well and compete well against these guys who do understand how to bowl. So I think a big thing for youth bowlers and junior gold is to be realistic in how, how good you actually are. Um, and before you go out to junior gold, it's your job to make sure that you put in the work necessary to get to where you need to be and not just think, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to have a good week or this is going to be a dream week or things are going to be together. No, you need to be realistic in saying if you're not comfortable with 10 pins, then you work at 10 pins until you are. I think that mindset is the mindset that you need to, to become good in general. And it starts when you're a youth. So, Absolutely. So, junior gold, you know, prepare, bowl on, being able to play all different parts of the lane, pick your spares and keep yourself in it. You know, it's it's that easy. And then you'll have a chance to win. I mean, spare, spares are big. Spares are so big, man. <laughs> Just don't miss them, any of them. Yeah, so. so. Yep. All right. Well, you want to wrap this up? Yeah, man. This was good. Yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. We had a, 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 you know, our biggest following, I think, yet. We peaked at 40-something, and I think the lowest we've gotten in the past yeah. hour has been just shy of 30. So Appreciate it. We'll get, we'll get better at this. Yeah, this no, is I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. We'll, we'll get together and do these live Q&As more, and we'll, uh, we'll yeah. keep you guys updated with the channel. Like Before, when we created the channel, we didn't know what it was or where it was going to go or what we were even doing. Um, and so now we're getting to the point where we have a direction and we have a little yeah. bit of a, a fan base for the channel and a following. So we want to do our best to kind of communicate with you guys and, and let you know, know what's going on with our lives and what we plan on doing. So, yeah, thanks guys for following. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll be posting this on our channel so you can, you know, if any of you guys missed any of it, you can go back and watch it. So, all right. Cool. Well, I'll see you guys. I'll, uh, good luck in Syracuse, Kyle. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, so. just don't uh, shoot 1944. That'd be good. That's a good number for you. 1944? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good number. Uh, actually, I'll be happy if I shoot 1944. <laughs> I don't think I'll be too mad. Yeah. Well, all right. I'll see, all you. Right. see, see you. See you guys.